Good afternoon. My name is Jared Carney and I have the honor of moderating the Human Performance Panel today here at the Milken Institute London Summit. You all have been fed a meal of both ideas, relationships, and hopefully after this session, tools. Tools to be better for yourselves, your teams, your families, and the organizations that you care most about. We're honored to have with us a very illustrious um, group that I'll introduce very briefly, and I encourage you to look at their full biographies on the app or the website um, accordingly, because we don't want to waste too much time with pleasantries, and we want to get to the heart of the matter. Um, from my left, sitting next to me, is Brian Ferguson, founder and CEO of Arena Labs, which uh, he spent about 15 years in the high performance field. And he teaches people and works with people, decision makers in the national security fields, corporates as well. He has a background in the United States Navy special operations. Um, and he's uh, um, someone who is sought after globally. And we're delighted to have him. Next to him is Dr. Rajan Jethwa. Um, calls, uh, comes from closer by here in London and the UK. Uh, Rajan is the founder of Ellipsis Pharma, his seventh company. Um, he's an entrepreneur, a surgeon, and has started and formed businesses that focus on the performance, particularly the performance of teams worldwide. Next to him, we have Rebecca Stevens, author, mountaineer, and director of Seven P Summits Performance Limited. Um, Rebecca is the first British woman to climb Mount Everest and all the uh, seven summits globally. So it's a... <laughs> And also from the Commonwealth at the end is Andy Walsh, <laughs> uh, founding partner of Liminal Collective, uh, who is uh, one of the world's leading human factors experts. Um, Andy is the person, actually, and we'll leave with Andy um, because of the video lead-in. Andy founded and built Red Bull's human performance um, collective, and that entire effort of Red Bull. So Andy, you, you literally took us jumping off from space yeah. onto the, you know, onto the planet. You and Felix, obviously, let's give Felix the lion share of credit, shall <laughs> yeah, we? Yeah, I, I would actually, yeah. <laughs> I'm a little old for that, actually. What, why is that an exercise in human performance? Well, I think, and, 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 and thank you all for coming to this session, I appreciate the attendance. The, the, the message that you heard there, especially and, and sort of elucidated by uh, Ben Pop Venn, from Cirque du Soleil was, I think those high stakes inspirational events really speak to the idea of what human performance is about. But what's missed by most is how much that training and preparation and practices that we learn from those events translate to everybody. And what Ben was alluding to about finding your edge is really speaking to this notion of humility. And in the best performance in, in teams and individuals in the world, the idea that you're always learning, you're always thinking about how to become better. And to do that, you have to put yourself just a little bit beyond what you're currently capable of doing. You have to find that edge. You have to look over the edge a little. And if you're supported in that way, you can progress and grow. And whether you're in business, sport, military, you know, you know, politics, that principle transcends everything. So even though it looks very much unattainable to jump from the edge of space, the principles behind it apply to everybody. And that's why we're so excited about those sorts of lessons. Thank you, Andy. Rebecca. Did, when you thought about climbing Everest, when you, you know, when you changed your life to become a mountaineer, was it about an edge that you wanted to demonstrate to yourself or to others that you had? Well, why, how is it that you, you know, do, do you, does what Andy's saying about edge um, you know, resonate with you? It, it does, actually, and I, I really wish they were my words, and I'm going to plagiarize them <laughs> and keep them for myself. You'll say them much more um, nicely than your accent. Um, <laughs> My experience was probably a little bit different. I mean, to say uh, um, I, I take trek sometimes and somebody was interested in something I was doing, then turned it down and said, no, it's not challenging enough for me. And I thought, gosh, that's really quite interesting. And I didn't talk about that in that language to myself. But yes, it was challenging climbing a mountain. But for me, it came from a place where, um, you know, through my 20s, probably I've been exploring different things. I wasn't quite clear what I wanted to do. I tried all sorts of different things. I went as a reporter to Everest and met these people who'd given up a hell of a lot to climb this mountain and uh, just had never seen that sort of passion before. And wrote an article about why climbers climb. And in doing that, I went up 
on to the, to the first camp on the Northeast Ridge. And I just found for myself something that was so exhilarating at so many levels that I couldn't let it go. And it felt like, it felt like coming home in a way that it absolutely fitted me. And I think that's the thing that's so important important in achievement is having an awareness, and it might take exploration, as it did in my case, to find that. But then, you know, I went through four years, I didn't give up my job, I went back this time to climb it. And if I can say, none of it really felt like hard work because I loved it so much. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, the, there was a risk in giving up a job and all the rest of it, but I couldn't let it go. It just felt totally right for me. And um, so, yeah, then it, it was almost fair to complete. I mean, there were lots of challenges to overcome, and we can talk about other aspects which made it possible. But essentially, it was because my actions aligned with who I was and what I wanted. So, um, thank you. So, Brian, you know, humility, <laughs> passion, um, integrity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so can you talk about in the context of you know, um, your background? Yeah, so, so as Jared mentioned, I now am privileged actually to, to work with folks like Rajan who are surgeons, we work with medical teams. Uh, but prior to that, I was privileged to spend time in the military and the special operations community. Whenever one thinks of the military, I think it, it, it becomes a fascinating environment where values are at the center of everything you do and team is at the center of everything you do. Um, but the biggest takeaway, I think for me that was so profound is I, I would consider myself in every way a very average person. And so when you're in a place that has, that is rooted so strongly in values that people are committed to, and in turn are committed to a team, one suddenly transcends what you're capable of. And it almost sounds cliche, but it's incredibly profound. And so that became my passion. How do, we, how do you harness that amongst people who otherwise think of themselves as everyday, everyday people? Um, and, it, and I always bring it back. I mean, you just, you just gave a set of values. But to me, what you heard, even in you know, Rebecca being very humble, is unequivocally, when you meet people in, who are extraordinary or world class, whether they be investors, whether they be elite athletes, creatives, special operations, it's rooted in humility. And it's not the humility that says, don't be braggadocious or don't boast, but rather, no matter how good I think I am, there's more to learn. No matter how much I've done, there's another way to approach the craft. And that in and of itself, I think, when you can, when you can truly ground an organization in that spirit, it's amazingly powerful. Rajan, is there a, a formula for this? I mean, it, or do you have to sort of come at the creation of teams and excellence in human performance um, with one way, you know, this sort of foundational set? But I mean, have you, and you've, you've started seven companies, so, you know, is, is, have you been able to replicate it? It's a good question, and, and replication is always what you're trying to achieve, but you have to replicate it in completely different environments at each time. So there's, there is a formula, but the formula is very high level. It, it, it's about trying to understand what the mission of the company is, is about, and my current company is, is about developing cancer drugs, and that changes the the modus operandi of how you build your team. You pick your expertise. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very, very similar to Brian. I consider myself very average as a, as a human being. I don't necessarily excel at anything in particular. Um, and that means it's very important for me when I establish a company and you know, choosing the right partner. So I'll give you an example. In Ellipses Pharma, my partner, business partner is Sir Christopher Evans. He is essentially the father of UK biotech, 30 year history in developing companies. Uh, going forward, so you surround yourself with expertise and excellence that you don't have, and then you seek out financial expertise that fills a gap that you don't have, and then you seek out operational expertise. And in each company, it's slightly different sets of expertise, but the collective then essentially becomes your performance engine, and the company benefits as a result. So performance engine, right. So, Rebecca, take us back to not the decision to climb Everest, I think you referred to that well, but the decision to become a mountaineer and then take on the other six peaks because that was, a, you know, you, did you then have to see yourself as a different type of mechanism rather than as a journalist? Um, I never liked defining what I was particularly. I realized that looking back that I quite liked that vagueness around that. Um, and I still write, I'm writing a book at the moment. So I, I carry on both in parallel in a way. Um, did I redefine myself? I, I don't know. I think that the commonality through life 
because the difference, if you like, was from being employed to being unemployed, <laughs> or at least uh, employed to being self-employed, if you put it nicely. Um, and um, when you're in that position, you create some opportunities yourself, and then other opportunities might be presented to you. And I was conscious in some of those opportunities presented to me that I actually wasted quite a lot of time intellectualizing them. When, if I listened to my inner voice and loved it, then I, I, you know, it was much better to go with that because with full heart, I was likely to give more to the performance. And you know, we were talking about reputation earlier, that was important as well. Um, so yes, it did become that, but I think the big lesson, and for me, if I don't get a chance to say this, I have to put it in now, because it was the most important thing, and you refer to it as well with teams, and you refer to it with teams. And you know, you're talking about getting the best capacity in people, which is very important, but the glue between those people, I mean, there's lots of research to suggest, actually, that you know, the average intellectual power of a team isn't really the point. It's, it's the glue and the connections and the relationships between people that really, Absolutely. really, really make the difference. And on Everest, we went as a team, but um, when it came to the summit day, we'd already failed on one chance, and it was at the end of the season, and I had a chance to go back. And that chance to go back and give it another go was only because of two Sherpas, Ang Basang Kami Cherry. And, you know, on reflection, we had seven weeks together on the mountain. We drank a lot of tea together. We talked a lot together. We climbed high and came back in quite treacherous conditions together. And the trust had been built between us. And although we weren't physically attached with a rope or anything like that, there was no reason I couldn't have done it on my own other than the fact that I needed that companionship. I needed other people to muster the courage to do it. And, and you know, without them, I could not have done it. And although prior to Everest, I kind of knew intellectually that team bit was quite important, you know, but I didn't understand it viscerally until that experience. And I think having been through that, valuing those relationships, you know, giving people the, the feeling that they are contributing just makes all the difference between performance and, non, and no performance. Andy, yeah. uh, the glue, uh, as Rebecca puts it, can you measure glue? Is that quantifiable? There, uh, I think there is a quantifiable element. Um, there's lots of technologies being developed that look at it, the type of interaction a team can have by sensors that you're wearing and how often you speak, how you speak to each other. But I think you nailed it with the trust issue. And, and when you think of all the team building and kind of programs that are around building better teams, fundamentally what you're trying to do is accelerate trust mm. between the group. You're trying to, first and foremost, if we take one of our examples, we'll put them in a challenging, challenging situation, whatever it may be. And the challenge, the first thing is how do they understand themselves? How do you understand better who you are? We kind of give you an opportunity to look at yourself in the mirror and you, through a better understanding of yourself, you then start to learn more about the people around you. And even the simplest things like asking four or five fairly personal questions amongst your team of each other, which most people don't do, can uncover and layer things about each other that sort of helps accelerate that process. And I think, as you shared with the, yourselves on the mountain, over and over again, we see people, especially in higher risk situations or challenging situations, you just compressing that timeline. It can tap and I think average time to trust for a normal team's a couple of years, but you can compress that right down. Well, I'll be interested to know about how you do that, but you know, to the former point about looking at yourself first, this is a summit of you know, alphas. Mm -hmm. You don't have many shrinking violets at this, at this gathering. You know, when, you're, when you go into an environment either with, you know, in a military context or in a business civilian context, I mean, or you know, even team, you know, teams for athletes. I mean, are, do people really, really hold that mirror up honestly to themselves? Uh, we, we, tip, we typically hold it up for you. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's, how, that's our nature. We want you to, and, and that's back to the humility. You're working with people who want to understand themselves better. They, they come with that perspective. You put them in an uncomfortable situation. A recent Founders program we ran, we had them doing stand-up. And very quickly... Stand-up comedy. Stand-up comedy, which is, if I grab one of you out of the audience right now and got you up here and said, entertain the room with jokes for 20 minutes, it's a tough scenario, you know? 
<laughs> and we see, we see very quickly, you learn a lot about yourself and how you respond in, a, in an uncommon and uncertain environment. We see very quickly and we can support you and work through that. So whatever the activity we challenge you with, first you, you look at yourself and then we may add in psychometrics and other analysis to sort of help peel that onion back a little bit more. And then it's important that in, in, the, in the dynamic team building sort of quote unquote activity that you're sort of giving each other to a, the opportunity to see you. See you in a tough situation, see you at your best, but more importantly, see you at your worst. All right, so Brian, you know, you, you lived and worked in a community of what I think is technically called badasses for a long time, <laughs> right? I mean, is what Andy's saying, you know, practicable? From your perspective, I mean, we, in that community, were, was this something that people readily adopted, or you know, is there is is it is it actually come from that community? First of all, but badass is not my term. <laughs> <laughs> my term. Uh, yeah, and I, I will say I, my time there was brief, but again, in the spirit of humility, probably the most I've learned about this topic because I think there's a few folks in uniform here, which I deeply appreciate. I've I've since left, um, but I see it a lot in medicine actually, uh, and it's when you have the acuity of the, the, the sort of magnitude of the moment, it forces a congealing that's really powerful. Um, but the questions then transcend, because I think what happens a lot, we had this conversation earlier, is that people say, well, hey, I'm not a surgeon, or I'm not serving in the military, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just building a business, or I work in finance. Um, but I think it's, it's equally, if not more critical in those worlds, because how do you get someone to come in inspired and to love what they do? And one of the things that Andy, so I first crossed Andy's path when he was running Red Bull High Performance, and I was still in the military, and what was profound to me is that he was asking people questions like, who are you? Take a, a group of executives into a room and have a Cirque du Soleil performer pull people on stage, and you have to now cry in front of your colleagues and then laugh. And the purpose there is not to embarrass someone, but to get to that element of vulnerability which is an overused term, I think, in today's world, but at the end of the day, when you think about what is it that makes a military unit so profound or prolific or a great athletic team, there's a vulnerability that comes with just spending time with each other. Oh. And that starts with who are you? Why are you here? Mm -hmm. And in the military, back to your question about values, that's really powerful, but in business, I think a lot of people, now that I'm an entrepreneur, people overlook it or shirk it and say, well, that, you know, we don't have the same mission. And I couldn't agree more, or disagree more, excuse me. It's about how do you create that mission and then get people to ask that question, who are you? and bring it to life in a team. And it's, again, I think that's where you start transcending what what day-to-day -day life can, can sometimes seem mundane. Thank you. Rajan, so Brian mentioned surgeons and medical, term, uh, medical teams. So can you give an example of where you've actually created or empowered medical teams um, and, kind of, and demanded a high level of performance in a, you know, an environment that would be, many would think would be, uh, you know, difficult to maintain that in? Sure. Um, I think it's probably not a medical team, but it's, it's a team that does medical things. Yep. So, um, the example I think is probably best to give is building a stem cell bank, a cryogenic freezer, if you like, in the middle of the desert. Um, not the sort of place that you'd want to store at minus 108 or 9 degrees Celsius. Um, and thinking about the logistics that are involved in not only just building a facility that can keep things cool, but how that then operates when the outside temperature is 60 degrees Celsius and 95% humidity. Um, you then need to think a little bit about, okay, if you can store your cells, how then do you get your cells into the facility safely? How do you get them out of the facility? Because of course, if you can't put product in, you don't have any product. If you can't send it out, what's the point of having the product? Um, and so the, the example that, that, uh, that, that I'll give, it, it stems from the company that we set up um, to do just this, to, to pump prime essentially a system of stem cell banking and storage for the use of transplant um, in a population that didn't have any infrastructure at all around this. In the Western world, in America and the UK, for example, we, we, are a very, we have decent bone marrow banks, we have different bone marrow registries, we can get transplants uh, from related individuals fairly simply. Um, but for a large part of the population outside of those occidental worlds, uh, you don't have that. So setting up the infrastructure is important and then building on top of actually you know, the, the facility of freezers, you need people to operate it. 
And thinking about it of an inhospitable environment, you then have the recruitment issues of taking great people out of a wonderful job in the, you know, it could be in California, it could be, you know, in Singapore, bringing them over to this inhospitable environment and saying, okay, now I want you to perform, but actually I'm providing you with none of the resources that you're used to. You can have none of the financial backup, you can have none of the infrastructure backup, you don't have any of the IT backup, but you still have to deliver a world-class certifiable service so that at the end of the day, children getting a transplant don't die. Mm. So that's, that's a problem in itself. And then you've got the scenario, okay, so then you have the operational team that then builds in stem cell processing, the operational team that operates outside of this inhospitable environment in different areas, trying to collect cells and bring them back to, to base, so to speak. That, that challenge um, is, it goes to what Brian was saying, it's about trying to find what inspires people at different walks of their life, different parts of their career, because that goes to motivation. If you can find what inspires somebody, you can help motivate them. If you can help motivate them, and then you apply Rebecca's terminology, the glue, because I think this is absolutely critical, you can have individually very excellent people. If you don't stick them together and they don't actually operate for the single goal, which is, let's talk about it in a company sense, the objectives of the company, um, then you have very, very good people doing individually great things, but collectively nothing. Yeah. So, you know, hopefully that gives you a little bit of a, a flavor. Uh, it's a flavor. Rebecca, you know, we were in the prep session talking about fear. We were talking about it in the context of a movie that's come out about a man um, who free climbed uh, kind of a, an incredible ascent in Yosemite, which I've not yet seen, but some of the members. Yeah, if, if anyone here's, obviously everyone here's passionate about human performance or interested, but that, there's a new movie out called Free Solo, uh, which is an extraordinary movie about someone climbing. Um, gosh, what, what cliff? Was it the news? El, was it El Capitan? Uh, El Capitan. El Capitan. No, no El Capitan. ropes. I mean, no, so yeah. just climbing a cliff face. It's insanity. In, yeah. If you see, even the preview is uh, chilling. But, <laughs> but so we were talking in the prep session um, about a moment where, you know, you have to make a decision yourself. And, you know, we've already talked about sort of the glue and, and obviously the strength of a, a chain is going to be its weakest link. How, you know, how do you... How do you sort of face, if you've held the mirror up to yourself, as Andy says, right? How do you, in a moment where you have fear, how do you rewire yourself to get through it? Is there an example of that happening um, that you can tell us about and that you can walk us through? Uh, that's very kind of you. And, and the film, by the way, I've seen a previous film about this guy where he is 2,000 feet above the ground with his toes hanging on just on a tiny ledge, being filmed from a distance, completely on his own, nothing anybody can do to help him. And doubt creeps into his head that he can finish the 1,000 feet above him. And you're watching, <laughs> your palms are getting very sweaty. And somehow he manages to turn that around and, in your words, rewire his brain to, to keep going. I've never been in that situation, but I've been in situations where I can relate to that, I suppose, at some level. And uh, we were talking about a couple of occasions where those voices you have in your head, and I would challenge everybody in this room, they must have different voices in their heads at different times, sometimes telling us we're rubbish, sometimes saying, no, we're going to be fine. And I've had two occasions in my life when those voices have been so loud and so clear, they were sort of physically on one shoulder and the other, and one was screaming, you're going to die, and the other was, going to say, was saying, you're okay. One of them was jumping out of a plane, military people, I'm sure lots of people have done that. The other was um, on an ice climb on Mount Kenya. It is called the ice window route um, because it has a window in a curtain of ice. Um, and you climb into a cave behind that, then you come out of the window on sheer ice and climb up above it. And um, it was a Actually, I have to say, it was the first serious ice climb I had done. Um, I wasn't leading it. I was climbing with somebody else who had led the pitch above me. But it had to go far out to one side. So in this quite awkward manoeuvre, if I got it wrong, I was going to pendulum a hell of a long way, a long, long way above the ground. And he was hanging on by an ice screw that may or may not have held. I don't know. Anyway, the point was, this is when I was, you know, one voice was saying, you're going to die. And the other voice was going to say, you're going to be fine. In a way, I feel like I was pushed into listening to the voice telling me I was going to be okay because there was no alternative. There's no going back on a route like this. You, you just, you know, there is only one way. And in that situation, you're forced to find out, I suppose, 
what your capabilities are, I suppose. You know, because I, I did. My old knees were jittering like a singer sewing machine, all the rest of it. But somehow, you have to find a way through it. And I, I had that one experience. I had another one, if I can relate, where high on Everest, interestingly enough, I was maybe 8,600 meters, not far from the summit, on the way down. Two Sherpas, Ang Pasang, Kami Cherry, and myself, nobody else on the mountain. The visibility just closed in. If those of you who have been skiing or climbing and the visibility clouds come, you can't see one thing, everything's white. And we we're on a narrow ridge, and in that situation, we couldn't move. If we move, we'd fall off, very likely. So we were just stuck there. And that was the first time on the mountain, although I've been frightened many times, when I thought, our luck has run out. Because, you know, if, if the visibility, if the cloud didn't clear and we were benighted high on the mountain and we were on our way down, the chances of survival are very, very small. And in that moment, I see it, I'm afraid, just quite basically, scientifically. I mean, there was no reason to fly and, and nothing to fight. The, there was no reason for the adrenaline. It was beyond that. Mm. And there was a point of acceptance when I felt utterly calm. Utterly calm utterly calm. And it gives me huge reassurance that when we face death, when we push ourselves to risks, we have a mechanism to deal with it. We do have a mechanism to deal with it. Fantastic. So Andy, <clears throat> there is a mechanism to deal with it. Our luck has run out potentially. How do you train a person or a group? Technically, let's get brass tacks. How do you train to that moment so that you know, there is a clear way to problem solve when it comes? Well, it obviously depends on the specific, specific instance, but it's trainable. The first time you feel that is not the first time it really, shouldn't be the first time it really counts. So the idea is <laughs> that's that you... <laughs> that's great. <laughs> don't let your great first time be your first time. <laughs> yeah, don't let your first, first time, time be, be your first, first time. time. Right. And the reality of our training is we try and come at you and push you to that edge you feel, you get a taste of it. It's not life or death per se in training, or we try not, make, try not to make it life or death in training. And you get a taste of it. You get to see and feel it. You get to know how you respond. That mirror comes pretty clear. And then we pull you back a little from that edge. And, and to be specific, it's got to be something either we can create an environment that is, in your world, maybe a very critical presentation, or you've, you've placed a bet in the fund or the markets, excuse my lack of knowledge, however it works, but there's a lot of money on the line and you're the person holding the bill. Um, whatever that is, it's hard to do that in the world that you practice every day because you've grown up in it and you've been trained in it and you've kind of developed some some tools or mechanisms already to cope, and you can kind of hide a little in that space. Again, pull you out of that and put you on the edge of Everest or about on, on a stage in front of people exposing yourself in, a, in an emotional way, you'll very quickly ramp to that same level of anxiety and stress. So the first trick is how do we come at you and get you to that point? The second trick is how do we then allow you to just get enough taste so we're supporting you, we're giving you the tools, uh, in terms of how to navigate that, and then we can pull you back. And the more you do it, the better you get at it. And so the idea is it's a gradual, in the classic sense, it's a horrible term, stress inoculation. In, 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 in a more uh, supporting term, it's literally about that mirror, the challenge we put in front of you is just beyond your capabilities. The people you manage, you put them in a, you give them room, they fail, they realise that failure is just a point of learning. And one of the critical things in terms of the training, which again, we've learned from the soft community so well, is that after every time you do one of these trainings, you debrief and you debrief powerfully. And you can also apply that same to any actual real world example. And the purpose of the debrief is not to find out what went wrong per se, and in most cases in business, who to blame. It's about painting the most accurate picture of what happened the outcome of that picture, and so that everybody learns and moves forwards and grows. Panel, is that I, specific? Yeah, enough? that's yeah. very specific. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I come from a theatrical family. Is this any different than what's been known in theatre for hundreds of years in terms of rehearsing, notes afterwards, yeah. you know, yeah. putting it all on the line on stage in front of your colleagues and then an audience? I mean, 
Rajan, is the same? No, the same? not at all. Yeah. It's exactly the same. Yeah. As, as Andy was saying, we, we do the exactly the same thing in business. You, you role play things, you strategize, you go on away days, you think about what's coming in the next two, six, 12 months of your business, your company, and, and how you're going to attack the various problems that you've got. You're mentally, each individual is running various permutations and combinations of each event through your own mind, so that when it actually happens, and for example, in negotiation is a classic example, of if you have not, at least mapped out how many different positions you're going to have to cover in your negotiation, you will come out unhappy, yeah. full stop. Yeah. If you want to actually manage the negotiation in a way that you come away with something that at least is valuable for your company and for your business, then you're going to have to have covered those permutations and combinations. Um, and we do this all the time. It's also, picking up on what Andy was saying very quickly, is to when you're growing a team and you're pushing a member of your team or a group of your team to, to actually surpass their own expectations, actually role playing a little bit, strategizing a little bit, but then actually just pushing them off the edge of the cliff helps a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you've got to, they've got to know they're supported, but not enough. They, they need to feel it. But to build on that, the way we approach training and, and why we can take, and Byron and I work together a lot, we can take anybody in the world and we feel we can add value is because the basic premises of performance are, f are founded in these principles that just apply. It's not sport does this and business does this and military. It's always that the, the fundamental principles are the same. But in the cases of where we've probably seen a lot, if we were trying to, and we have a, a group, if we were trying to train you in negotiation, we would say you could probably go to great business negotiation school, I assume. We wouldn't bother with that. We would just say, who are the best negotiators or people who understand human behaviour at the highest level in that scenario, one-on-one, -on -one, one one-on-two? And we bring in, and we have, we bring in a world-class interrogator. And the interrogator sits down with you and pulls you apart and rips you down and shows you what the cues are. And these people, for a living, work in counterterrorism, FBI, special operations, things like that. And so they've already forgotten most of the things you'll never even learn. And so they just dump down to you and you learn from best in class. And that's how we sort of translate those skill sets so quickly. Brian, a comment on that, but also, you know, does it ever go too far? So yeah, in, the, think, in the pursuit think, of performance, can well, it actually break a person? Yeah, and I think well. in the spirit of this room, why are we here? And in, in, in a, although it may sound dramatic, most of the things, the camps we do or the way people train, it's really about incremental. I incremental uh, pushing one's edge. So, so to your question about theater, that opening monologue was, uh, how many people are, are familiar with Cirque du Soleil? Right, so, so that opening monologue was one of the trainers for Cirque du Soleil. It trains the acrobats and the actors. And you could take that monologue and you could put it in special operations, you could put it in medicine, in climbing, in sport. Yeah, okay. And so it, at the end of the day, when we talk about human performance, I'm increasingly convinced it is as simple as pushing our own edge each day. Where it gets tricky in a room like this, and why it always fills up at a conference, is we want to hack, right? What's the, you know, what, I'm guilty of this. What do I don't, what don't I know? And what we find is really interesting. We just did this actually, Andy and I, a group of 25 heart surgeons in the US, and we took them out for training. And people like you, like all of us, the world we live in, it's very rare that we're uncomfortable truly out of our comfort zone. You've, you've risen to the top of your respective organizations in a way that, of course, the dynamics of modern capital markets give you stress. But at the end of the day, these are things that you've probably seen before. And so if we can find a way to incrementally push ourselves out of our comfort zone, that's how we continue to grow back to that opening spirit. And I think, again, that's where Andy talks about we pull from these other domains, not in a way to embarrass anyone or make them feel like they're inadequate, but instead to say, look, here's how other disciplines who are at the top of their game like you may be continue to grow and in, in that spirit of humility get better. But also building on that, Brian, that's the fastest way to learn. Yeah. You pull somebody out of their comfort zone, but you give them something that is completely unrelatable to the day-to-day -day task. Mm -hmm. That is much more memorable. It's, yeah. it's easy then to pull on when you need it, and it's easy to, it's easy to then to, to learn. Yeah. So I, I completely agree. Rebecca, did, any, you know, did you have coaches? Did you figure all this out on, yourself, uh, on your own? You still figuring it out? I'm still figuring it out. Yeah. <laughs> but but interesting enough, um, for four years, I, I it was a great thing. It was a great fun. But I took um, 15 or 16, 17 that sort of number of women uh, who were doing an MBA at the Rotterdam School of Management up Kilimanjaro. We were talking about that earlier, and so that was really uh, about leadership and you know confidence and things like that. And you could see that you know women who were really you know very serious about their careers 
doing an MBA, usually around the age of 30, I could have been the mother of all of them, um, and uh, seeing them and talk, having a chance to talk and what have you. But the, the, the debriefing afterwards was amazing. You know, in the moment, you come off the mountain, most of you have been to the top, maybe a few haven't, um, and some of the comments that come out like that, and one just when you were talking reminded me, because this woman, she was so brilliant in her career, but somewhere along the line, she lacked self-confidence, and she said, that mountain just reminded me I'm made of steel, you know? And, <laughs> and so there are experiences outside, you say, totally different, which is a lot about confidence, isn't it? Isn't that what we're talking about? And dare I say, confidence can be quite fragile. So, you know, conversation earlier about, you know, women going back into the workplace having taken a break. You know, a lot of women halt at that stage where there's no reason to. They've just been out of the game for a couple of years. But it's very easy, actually, to build up that confidence again and be just where you set off or even better. Interesting. Um, Interesting. Um, you, brought up, you brought it up, not me. Okay. Age. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, when you think about performance, I think, at least in a Western cultural sense, there's a bias towards youth, generally speaking. It's my editorialization. Please feel free to refute it, if you will. How much of what you do is either biased towards, a, you know, a younger person's ability to do certain things physically and teaching that person mental tricks, hacks, if, if your word, Brian, or even emulating wisdom that they might not yet have from experience. So when, when you, and then the corollary is, you know, what can be done with people later in life in terms of human performance? What can be taught? What, you know, things you want to address that? I, this is actually a, a, a passion issue of mine. And I look at this room in general, I'd say everyone in here has not even yet reached peak performance. Because when you, con when you conflate, when you start to add wisdom into life experience and you think about that there never has been a more amazing time to be alive in terms of what we know about ourselves, the human mind, how we can augment ourselves in, in either learning, in advanced training, and it's still very much about the human. And so the things that we learn early in our careers, then how do we, how do we apply that later? And we talk about human performance, whether that's cognitively or physically. One of the things I always take issue in the States, especially people in their late 20s will start calling themselves old. <laughs> right? and, it's, and, and of course, if we stop moving physically, we're not as physically capable as we once were. But I'm a deep believer in that mindset. When we, when we talk about performance, it really is a mindset of how am I constantly improving, not for the purpose of beating other people, but to, to more deeply experience life. And that's really what human potential is. And again, I think at this moment in time, it's the reason that these discussions are so exciting and aspirational. Because we can be 30 years into a career and still have 20 to 30 years left to use what we've learned to impact the world. And that's incredibly powerful. Andy, oh, sorry. I, was just yeah. gonna add, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head because you've immediately created the dichotomy between what is physical performance and what is cognitive performance and where the two marry each other in that respect. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure everybody in the room is familiar with your favorite sports person, whoever that is. You know, everybody wants, if you're a basketball player, wants to be Michael Jordan or LeBron James. And you, you, it's a physical peak that that you start off being quite young. As you, as you realize that your body, or at least I did, my body's not necessarily built that way, <laughs> um, and, and you start to see your physical peak, if you like, almost fall off a cliff, actually you end, you end up marrying that up to your cognitive peak and you realize you haven't even scratched the surface. The, 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 the crux for us is to try, as, you're, as, as I'm building a company, and, and I'm sure the guys on the panel think the same, is to take the people at the various different parts of their lives and bring forward the cognitive development, as well as trying to eke out the physical as long as humanly possible. Um, you know, and that, that doesn't matter if you're CEO of a FTSE 50 company, you still want to be able to function for 10 hours a day and go home and be a nice dad and a good husband and a, and a, great, you know, and a great sports person at the same time. You, so you need that physicality to, to last into your 50s, 60s, 70s if you can. At the same time, you don't want your cognitive performance to drop. And so you're trying to do multiple things that are marrying what defines an elite performer, physical, training, diet, lifestyle. Yeah. And then you're also trying to learn on top of that, hone that learning, learn more efficiently in the less time that you have to exist anyway. So, Andy, do you want to sort of give us a couple of... Uh, developments in the field in terms of cognitive performance training that the attendees, the audience may or may not know about? Yeah, thanks. Um, well, I think you know, one of the 
sort of challenges of our business is people do default to the physical because it's the easy, most easily understood and it's also the most easily measured. When you get into the cognitive and then the spiritual elements of performance, obviously it becomes a little more esoteric. But the huge frontiers for us right now are obviously in the cognitive enhancement. Interestingly, some of the pioneering work that's coming and funded right now is obviously coming out of the esports community, which is people playing professional video games, the resources being applied to that world. Giving that driver, and then on the flip side, people in analysts, programmers, the funding that's sort of going towards those communities, there's this huge volume of resources that are being applied, which transcends well, I hope, for education in the future. What's coming? Well, I think we're getting very good at looking at the inner workings of the brain in terms of where we were. Five, ten years ago, it was literally psychometrics and some how are you feeling today kind of. <laughs> and, and a world-class coach can look at a face and pick that up. Now with uh, uh, micro-expression recognition, pupil dilation, heat sensing from the cameras, things like We can patch into cognitive state far better than we ever have. Inner EEG systems we're looking at, which now can translate real time how a person may be in terms of cognitive load. All of these things are going to give you a far better state, not only physically of where people are, but cognitively where they are. Then, you, then you're sort of starting to paint a better picture. What's fascinating in the cognitive realm, and this is kind of out there, but I'll toss it in for fun, is recent work that's being done on just bypassing the whole sensing experience and translating outputs from the world into semantic or uh, uh, haptic sensing. And the short story is what we're looking at is some of the systems and the complexity of the signals that people are being asked to interpret in trade or in, in, in uh, special operations or meteorology, any of those examples, the brain, the, the audiovisual system, there's just not enough bandwidth for you to absorb all that information. We heard recently some fascinating new trends that are going to be coming fairly quickly in terms of uh, sensory augmentation or sensory addition, where you take a complex signal, and I'll try not to bastardise this, this analogy, <laughs> but they had traders, they had one traders trained up at a fairly high level, doing the normal thing, making deals on the computer, etc. however that works, and then they had another group of traders just being stimulated high and low, but the signals were being fed into a haptic vest. So all the trade signals from the Dow, I think it was, or SAP were being fitted, and things were buzzing. They didn't know what was buzzing or how it was buzzing, but they knew when the hop was up, they started to learn up was up and down was down. And after about, do you remember, it was Marana, several hours of six or eight to 10 hours of training, that group of non-traders were trading as well as professional <laughs> traders because we're That's learning the big takeaways. The brain can take complex signals. It's one of the best computers in the world and translate them in ways we don't understand. And they're, they're starting to short circuit this system. So I don't think that's really applicable next week, but uh, <laughs> my point being, this world is advancing so rapidly. The, the opportunities to understand human state far more holistically, which means you as a manager or a leader can look around the room and really understand where people are at how they're feeling and how they're really coping. And given the longevity conversation earlier today and Mike's emphasis on human capital, getting more out of your people for longer in a more appropriate way and delivering and getting them to optimise, this is, this is going to fill in a huge gap in the system. I don't want to gloss over something you just said. You said spiritual performance. Um, does everybody on the panel agree that spirit, you know, there's a dimension of human performance that Absolutely. can be uh, sort of expressed by a spiritual <coughs> development? No, I, I completely agree with that. Um, there's a sort of a metaphysical and then a, then a spiritual element. Um, I'll give you a personal, very classic example. So um, at the beginning of this year, <coughs> as I was building out ellipses, we were, we were running quite fast, basically three or four people in the office trying to do 24 people's jobs. And I was suffering from not having enough hours in the day to actually perform at the level that I wanted to perform. So a chance meeting at the Vatican, bizarrely, um, uh, led me down a path to learn how to meditate using transcendental meditation. And that has actually been really, really interesting because what it's absolutely managed, enabled me to do is to maintain the level of performance that I wanted to maintain for much longer without needing to take the breaks that I would have normally needed to take. Now, I don't know how it works, <laughs> but it works. And so far, what I've done is pledged to the, the whole company that as we build out our new office this year and next year, we'll put in a meditation room, we'll make 
uh, TM available to them at, at no cost. No, of course, there's no obligatory you know, requirement to do it, but if you want to do it and you think it'll help, then you can carry on and do it. I would say, um, pulling this thread a bit, I, I would unequivocally agree, whether it's in, in a secular sense, whatever one's faith or spiritual uh, proclivity, but the, the, there's a, this year the New York Times just released the 10 best books of the year, and one of them is Michael Pollan's How, How to Change Your Mind. How many people have read that book in here? Oh. So it's, it, it gets into this, the science of psychedelics. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's something that, you know, particularly in U.S. culture, I think, you know, here in, in um, U.K. as well, but in the 60s was very much marginalized. And now we're learning that some of these substances, particularly plant medicines, connect people in a way to a spiritual sense. And when you look at a lot of phenomenal creatives, there, there obviously is a connection uh, so I'm someone who grew up in a very conservative environment, and it's just blown my mind. And you start to look at the, the cutting-edge research going on around psychedelics, uh, and I actually think that's one of the exciting frontiers of the next decade in the I'll, human mind. And I'll build on that, because in, in, if you hang around an elite performance, there's always rules about how to govern performance, like so sport and drugs, and, but they're always ahead of the curve. And when you look at the trends in, say, the valley right now, up north of, in San Fran from where we live, the microdosing and things that is going on is a real thing, and people are searching for this improved creativity. And they're ahead of what's obviously permissible and what's also proven, but you see that in our world, whatever the athletes were doing, the research would back up about 10 years later. So there's this, there's this search, I should say, probably as a way of thinking about it. People understand that these ideas of looking and expanding human cognitive performance are out there. Luckily, it's gone past massive doses of Ritalin and Adderall to kind of keep you awake and focused for hours because that was definitely a bad trend for a while there amongst the workplace. But uh, it's a fascinating space, and people are now recognising that if you can get a competitive edge in the cognitive realm, it has a real value proposition, and that's driving performance. Thank you. So uh, speaking of competitive edge and also unintended consequences, we're going to open up the floor to some questions. <laughs> um, I would just ask that... Um, they be real questions, um, not statements. So uh, the gentleman just here. Thanks. Hi, uh, thank you very much for that. A uh, very short question. Um, if you could give one tip for enhancing performance that you've seen work in your own lives, what would it be? Uh, we've heard about transcendental meditation, but maybe there's something in addition. Uh, how many people in here do your blood work regularly? Uh, so this is probably a unique audience. That's maybe 10%. Uh, I think, again, the way that science has advanced around blood work, it can be expensive, but it's, just, it's getting increasingly democratized. And having an understanding of your blood work in terms of what are you allergic to, and you know, wh wh what does your body react to negatively, not a massive allergy. Uh, I, I actually, through one of Andy's uh, sports scientists, recently did it, and it, it blew my mind. Mineral deficiencies, some very basic things that you can, you can augment. And that's something in this type of room where everyone has a, enough disposable income, I think. And then, and then figure out how to do that for your teams is a really powerful way for people to understand day to day, how is nutrition and lifestyle affecting how I feel. An interesting build on that is there's a lot of neurotransmitter markers, brain performance metrics we're looking at, which we can now see. And a lot of the, the corporate testing we've done, boom you know, down, very low. So, uh, but from our per my personally, I, I go back to that edge. The one thing I say to people, no matter where your edge is, it could be here or here, it doesn't matter. The feeling when you get next to it is the same for everybody. Find something, challenge yourself, pick something that you can do that lets you look at yourself through a different lens. And if you've got the bravery to do it in the team environment you work in, get everybody to share that and see you in that vulnerable state, especially if you're a leader, that has profound impact on breaking down barriers, improving trust. You learn about you, you understand better how to manage yourself. Through that, you learn how to manage others better. Rebecca? Yes, I mean, firstly, I think both those ideas, I might have my blood done, actually. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, I'm going to add just one dimension to that, and that's sort of sustainability over time, not just performance in the short term. And um, the way I've started thinking about it is like on a vertical axis and a horizontal axis. And the vertical one is about achievement. In my world, it's, you know, <clears throat> the, the language happily coincides about reaching for the summit and such like. Um, and that is really, really critical, and I found that's what I've been talking about for 20 years. But for me, the horizontal axis and really focusing on that is incredibly important as well. And by that, I mean looking after oneself in terms of nutrition. For me, sleep is critical. 
really, really important exercise. Um, and whatever it, you need to nourish yourself to be able to keep going at peak performance over a length of time is really important. You cannot be on the vertical axis all the time. Mm. You know, if I'm going to add real quick, I'm sorry, uh, but yeah. the, the sleep one, I will say, most of you are in a world of finance, which is like medicine and like the military used to be, which lack of sleep and performance was, was considered something to be proud of. And we increasingly know, I tell you, that parts of the military <laughs> have completely changed the way they do training in order to get people more sleep because we now understand the long-term effects of a lack of sleep. Uh, so I would, the other one I'd say is track your sleep and understand the, the values. I'm about to have a baby in two months. My wife is, obviously. <laughs> um, so that's going out the window. I know as parents, that's not always practical, but that's something to be aware of. I think if I could just summarize, because I think what everybody's saying is, if you want to improve how you as an individual are performing, you have to know yourself. Yeah. And that's the basic element of what we're all trying to say, I think. Well said. Uh, there's a lady over here. Hi. Uh, can you talk a bit uh, if uh, ego becomes an issue with top performers, if they've done really well, how do you deflate the ego and uh, ensure continued good performance? Oh, great question. That's a good question. That's a great uh, question. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think the first thing is, is, to, is to sort of half ask you a question in return, and that is, is it ego that's driving the performance? Because you do get a few people that thrive on that. They, they, you know, that. That ego is driving how well they perform, and then managing that in a, in a, in a controlled environment, allowing them to indulge themselves is important. Uh, rather than deflating it, because actually you could just eliminate the performance by doing that. So I haven't really answered your question. I've just sort of made it more complicated, I think. <laughs> yeah. and Andy? You have a real... Well, I think, you know, to, to build on that, there's certain people who that, that is a driver for them. A again, question why. But a, a lot of the training we, the, 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 these groups are involved in, you literally at some point are going to fall short. It's designed to do that. So ego doesn't have much value at that moment, and that's the most critical moment because that's when you learn. So usually we challenge them in a certain ways, and again, very uncommon ways, so that, that that conversation gets pushed to the side, so to speak, because ultimately you're going to fall short, and when you fall short and how you respond at that moment is probably the best indicator of how you're going to be in the you know, day to day environment. Great. The just gentleman down here in the front. There's a microphone over here. Under the, under the Chatham House rule, of course, what currently illegal substance would each of you wish to <laughs> ask us to take? I, you, you can follow up with <laughs> each panelist. You can follow up with each panelist a, a, afterwards. <laughs> because we are being recorded. Um, and, and we'll be multicast to the web. Um, there's a gentleman over here. <laughs> If you meet me behind my car, no, just... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you spoke about that moment of peace when you were, you know, at the top of the ridge and, you know, you realize it might go badly, well, catastrophically. What my question was, was because you also, in the trading environment, you have this kind of when the risk mm. really comes at you and then I, I'm familiar with that feeling of peace, but it can also be really deceptive and actually, you know, the stopping out that we call it in trading, sometimes you just realize you're wrong and you get out. How do you balance that self-preservation with, you know, pushing yourself and out of your comfort zone? Because I suspect, especially high-performance people, you can kind of push yourself question. over the edge, essentially. Gosh, it, 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 this is, a, I'll try and keep it very short. I mean, one of the things about mountaineering, uh, I know more about British mountaineering than Americans, so forgive me for that, but, you know, if you look at the mountaineers now who are in their 70s, we've got Chris Bonington and we've got Doug Scott, and that's about it. And so through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, there were many elite climbers really pushing the envelope and knowing they were doing that, and sometimes pushing a bit far and paying with their, with their lives. And such as the ethos of mountaineering, that they're kind of held up in this sort of, you know, somewhat as heroes. Now, that's clearly not what we want in our working lives, but that's the sort of the backdrop, if I can. Um, but on Everest, what we see, I wouldn't consider it that elite mountaineering in the same way, but nonetheless, there are people every year trying to get to the summit of Everest. And every year, even though it's much safer now in terms of our understanding of it, satellite weather forecasting, oxygen, the list could go on, every year people still die 
um, and they die because of what we're talking about, that combination of ego, if you like, hubris, um, you know, thinking that they're bigger than nature, um, being in an emotional bubble, and I say this totally non-judgmentally because I've been in that emotional bubble, I know what it feels like, and I had luck on my side, we got away with it. But if you, if you don't, you see people pushing where the emotion, all the things that actually drive us, pushes so much that the rationality flies out the window. So what I find myself fascinated by is that fine judgment. <laughs> um, you know, uh, uh, when you, you, you allow the emotions to push and motivate, but you know when to stop. And that sometimes is possible in one individual, I would say with experience, very difficult for a very young person at the start of a journey, um, or you find it by working together. And this is where teams become so important. And in business, you might have somebody who's pushing, got the big vision, wants everybody to follow, and there's the quiet voice of rationality in the room. And we have to devise ways where we consciously ask for their opinion. We listen and don't push them down. Because when we do, we see the mistakes we've happened. We, you know, time and time again, the finance world, 2008, classic. You know. so, so I think that... Again, it's <laughs> coming back to your point, know thyself. You know, that self-awareness is the first point. Um, but then listening, that humility to listen to others and, and get their contribution as well. Rem I, I, I think we're, we're there. Unfortunately, we're there. I think Brian have one book recommendation. On that, on that topic, tag, right? everyone in this room would probably agree that some of the biggest mistakes you've had have been things you didn't, that didn't seem as risky. There's a book called Deep Survival, The Science of Who Lives and Who Dies. Who's actually, it's about the mountain environment, but it will apply to business. Uh, it is phenomenal about teams and, and when you make decisions in moments that seem like they're not risky. Perfect way to end. Um, thank you all very much. <laughs> thank me, thank me, uh, help me thank the panel for a terrific session. Thank you very much.